Singapore may be a little red dot, but our reach is global. Many local companies have expanded beyond our shores, broadening their footprint across the globe. Given today's fast-changing global economic climate, companies should consider venturing overseas to capture new opportunities, enhance business competitiveness, and achieve sustainable growth. Internationalization is a journey, starting from identifying the right market for expansion, to strengthening your capabilities, to taking that first step into the market. However, the journey is not always smooth sailing. Along the way, you will need the right resources and support. Help is at hand. Introducing Global Connect at SBF, the partner for Singapore companies looking to go global. Regardless of your internationalization journey, Global Connect at SBF can help. Established with the support of Enterprise Singapore, backed by an extensive network of partners globally, Global Connect at SBF delivers a comprehensive suite of services to support you on your journey. Join the other Singapore companies who had successfully expanded overseas. Embark on that journey now. Contact Global Connect at SBF today. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome on board the journey to internationalization. For companies who are keen to venture overseas, Global Connect at SPF is here to partner you along this exciting journey. Be it about identifying the right market for expansion, or strengthening your capabilities or taking your first step into the market, Global Connect at SPF can help in the following areas. Internationalization advisory, market information, business matching, capability development, and in-market facilitation. Our friendly market advisors are readily available to help you along this journey. Reach out to them for a complimentary discussion today. Together, we can make your internationalization journey comes true. Thank you. Dear His Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon. Thank you for attending the third edition of China Economy Outlook webinar series organized by Singapore Business Federation. As some of you may have known, in view of COVID-19's significant impact on businesses and industries locally and globally, SPF has launched this webinar series in order to provide regular updates on the latest work and production recovery situation in China and to help Singapore and regional businesses, including both large, large enterprises and SMEs to explore the new and underlying business opportunities beyond COVID-19. Two webinars under this series have been successfully organized in May and July earlier this year, with the first edition focusing on macro business outlook and the second edition focusing on new tech infrastructure. Over 600 business leaders, ambassadors, high commissioners, senior government officials, and diplomats from over 15 countries and regions have attended the two webinars. In today's session, our invited guests from Singapore and China will firstly share with us how their respective company and industry are developing, riding on the rise of the digital economy. They will also share how various companies, especially those market leaders, are constantly improving their technologies and services in different markets. In the second part of the webinar, our speakers will discuss how to catch the technological opportunities brought by digital economy, and at the same time, how to manage the potential risk in view of COVID-19. Before we start today's panel discussion, I would like to remind you that if you have any questions that you would like to raise, you may do so by using the Q&A Q function of, of this Zoom meeting at any time during the webinar. Our moderator and the panelist may choose to reply to you during the Q&A session or answer you separately. For those unanswered questions, we'll work with the speakers and respond to you individually after the event. 
as such, it is important for you to indicate your name and company name in the Zoom platform so that we can get back to you later. We would also like to invite you to take part in this poll, in the poll, which is already live now, to help us better understand your organization's digital adop adoption and your views on the digital economy. We'll close the poll at 3.30 p.m and share the results before we end the webinar. Without further ado, I would like to introduce Ms. Janet An, today's moderator to you. Ms. An is currently chairing Singapore Polytechnic and U.S. In Institute of Systems Science, SBF Digital Digitalization Committee, as well as the board of 60s.com. She is a retired IBM Vice President and former MD of IBM Singapore and is also a past president of International Women's Forum, Singapore chapter. Besides, Ms. Eun is also an independent director at SPH Limited and serves on the SPF Foundation and the Council for Board Diversity. Now, please allow me to pass the mic to Ms. Eun for today's panel discussion on Beyond COVID-19, Catching the New Waves of Opportunities Arising from Digital Economy. Ms. Eun, please. Thank you, Flora. I hope everybody can hear me nice, loud and clear. Good afternoon, Excellencies, SBF friends and partners, ladies and gentlemen. Now, um, let me add my warm welcome to this afternoon's SBF webinar and panel discussion in virtual space. I guess we are all here because, number one, the ASEAN digital economy is projected to grow significantly adding 1 trillion to the regional GDP over the next 10 years. And I guess the second key reason is, you know, especially with COVID-19's experience, the digital economy's growing role in rescuing the real economy is very real across the globe and definitely uh, in both China, in Asia, and in ASEAN and Singapore. Now, COVID-19 has certainly disrupted life and work including how we engage to learn and to dialogue. And since the COVID-19 circuit breaker, Zoom webinars such as the one we are attending today have become the new normal. So your very presence and attendance this afternoon is a testimony of the resilience and positive attitude of men and women rising above the challenges of these unprecedented times to keep the spirit of learning and engaging in conversations that help us see the opportunities even as we cope with the crisis. So SBF has set up the Digitalization Committee three years ago to advocate and to drive digitalization amongst our businesses, especially SMEs. Now, I must say that one of the positive effects of COVID-19 pandemic is that we are seeing more businesses stepping up in their digitalization transformation, realizing that digitalization has become an imperative for business survival and sustainability. Now, this afternoon, we are delighted to have three esteemed speakers in the tech space to share with us that even as businesses battle the pandemic and financial survival, there are new waves of opportunities out there for businesses to capture. As the Chinese phrase for crisis goes, weighty, <laughs> that in every crisis, there are opportunities. So allow me to very briefly uh, introduce our, my three panelists. First up, and um, Jeffrey, if you can just wave. Jeffrey is the former CEO of NETS, uh, someone I've known for a long time. He has more than 25 years of Infocom and payment technology experience. And he, was a, he played a key contributor role in the launch of the SGQR. So, Jeffrey, welcome. Next up is Merrick Wong, Mr. Wang Zhong. Now, Merrick is from China Mobile. He has more than 20 years of telco industry experience, both in the China market and overseas market. And he's currently the GM of the China Mobile International and APEC region. Wang Zhong, welcome. And um, our third speaker is Louis Liu, the founder and CEO of FOMO Pay. Now, um, FOMO Pay 
or shall we say Lewis, <laughs> is one of the 30 under 30, 30 individuals are under 30 years old, uh, listed in the 2018 Forbes in Asia uh, for the finance and venture capital uh, segment. And um, the company FOMO, which he, which he has founded uh, in 2017, uh, was awarded a FinTech Award by MAS and in 2018 was a, one of the OCBC Emerging Enterprise. They have uh, another success is that they have been recently acquired by AMTD, a financial conglomerate. And, um, you know, Lewis, very delighted to have you join the panel. So during the, you know, we'll start off, uh, you know, by inviting each of the panelists to give a brief five minute introduction and presentation, after which we will take questions and answers and have answers. All right, and um, if I can just remind everyone again, if you have questions as you listen to the presentation, please put the questions into the Q&A uh, feature of Zoom. Uh, include your name and your company, all right? And then I guess the second thing is do not forget to fill up the poll uh, which Flora mentioned just now. So without further ado, if I can ask Jeffrey to be the first up to make his presentation. Jeffrey, please. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Yeah, thank you, uh, SVF, for organizing this and giving me this opportunity, right, to do a webinar uh, for this. Okay, good morning, uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. It's a, indeed a privilege for me to present um, the new company that I just uh, on board. So can I have the next screen, please? Okay. So uh, recently I just joined Grab, right? So Grab has just formed a new venture. It's called GrabLink. Right, it's basically empowering the lives of millions of micro merchants across the Southeast Asia. Later on, I will describe a little bit more. Graveling is basically a joint venture between Grab, uh, Card Infoling of China, and TIS of Japan. So it consists of three countries: Singapore, Japan, and China. Right, for them is to basically to build and establish Singapore as a payment hub, right, to serve this Southeast Asia region. So of course, the core business is payment processing for Grab and its own services and also for non-Grab merchants, right? And also to support Grab Pay and the Grab platform for the online merchants and also other value added service. So why is it that uh, we need to do this? The main reason is that the digital economy in the whole of Southeast Asia is booming, right? Especially with Grab and Gojek in Indonesia and so forth. All right, as you know that Grab uh, has presence in eight countries, and they have grown the payment volume by 35% year on year basis. Then his ability to cross sells, right? Multiple solutions and platforms to the million of merchants across this region. The collaboration that Grab also realized is that they, they have to, right? Collaborate with all the ecosystem partners, the strategic partners in this ecosystem to build a scalable system for B2B platforms. Lastly, but not in terms of strategy is that they have the technology because of the partnership with TIS of Japan and Cutting Po Link of China. So they also assemble a team of uh, ex payment experts from Visa, Tencent, Ardian, Wirecard, Nets, and uh, Ali, and also. You have, also, they have uh, recently uh, secured a license for acquiring from Visa, MasterCard, Union Pay, and the rest. So basically, following up for the next uh, few, few months or few quarters, you're going to see a lot of services that's going to come up. And by the way, this company is only about 15 months old, right? Next screen, please. So just a little bit intro about Grab. Grab is currently as uh, noted as the number one super app in the Southeast Asia, right? You have over, I think by now, 180 million uh, apps downloads around the region, uh, 9 million plus micro entrepreneurs, including the drivers, the food and all this and present in eight countries and 350 cities, right? That's the latest statistics that we have. So every year, I mean, so not every year, every day, there's about uh, close to almost half, right, of the app users are active. So either they buy a food from Grab Food or they do a transaction or they take a Grab ride across the Southeast Asia. So next. So as we learn about what Grab as a whole, right, everyone is quite familiar in Southeast Asia for the transport, right? So you get a Grab ride taxi, whether in Singapore, Malaysia, or Thailand, right? It's a very popular ride. And then of course, uh, during the recent COVID, 
I think one of the greatest uh, savior is the grab food. A lot of people are uh, ordering their food, right? Instead of going out to the restaurants, they order the food all right, to be consumed at home. The other one that we started during this COVID uh, period is that uh, GrabMart is uh, gaining a lot of popularity. So we developed this platform just about less than a year ago, right? Because of this uh, COVID-19, a lot of grocers already come onto this GrabMart, right? As to serve their customers. In Singapore, we already have 5 million uh, app users, right? So for the rest, I will not go into it to bore you guys. We have insurance, hotels, rewards. It's very much like either the Ali or the Tencent of China, right? So next. So let's say set up the scene. Just now, I think uh, Janet has said that the uh, digital economy in this Southeast Asia region is about a, big, uh, a, a trillion, right? So which means the statistics that we have from Google and Tamase that was done a couple of years back, they say by 2025, it's a 300 million, right? Two X of that. So I feel that right now, Southeast Asia region is really gearing up, right? Because of COVID, it has accelerated. Not only that, Southeast Asia population is uh, primarily quite young. Indonesia, the, the, the so-called the, mid, the middle income bracket or the, the, the medium age is about early 30s, right? As compared to Singapore, it's closer to 50s. So we have a very young population in this Southeast Asia, Southeast Asia region. And I believe the rapid digitalization in the retail sector is real. And also for us, uh, Grappling, we identify uh, how are we going to help right, the merchants through their digital journey. It's to differentiate, not just payments, but also a suite of uh, VAS products that we're going to offer them. Plus on top of that, there's a lot of technology that's coming on board uh, very soon, uh, which I'll say, I will say that in the later part. Right? A lot of this technology now will be self-onboarding, which means that you can download an app on your phone, and the payments can be done right away, right? So, and on, on top of that, the millennials, the younger population, the retailers are asking for transparent pricing. Just for example, you take your, either your telephone, your, your mobile phone uh, uh, bills on every month basis, you do not know exactly what kind of pricing they are charging you. You just only know the minutes and so forth. But when it comes to payment today, a lot of people are asking for transfer, I mean, transparent pricing. APN stands for alternate, payment mode, which means that all the wallets of the world, be it Ali, WeChat, Tencent, and also I think PayLow, Mighty, and all these, right, will be another source of uh, payments on the digital platform. And the rest of the digitalization tools that Grab is going to offer is going to be a key differentiator. Now, the complication is here. A lot of the big companies, they target at the tier one merchants, which means the big departmental store, the big brand names like Nike, and, and so forth, right? We felt that the second tier merchants, the, the one that's less seen right, in the digital space, they are the one that has been underserved in the Southeast Asia region. That's why Grab having 9 million over micro merchants, we are reaching out to them right, in these uh, coming months. And also is that there's a lot of uh, complex use of transparent and dynamic pricing and digital tools that remain untapped. There's a lot of tools that are there out in the market, but this SME has not even right on it until recently where the COVID situation really hits them and they start looking and searching for that. So we believe that uh, this is the scene that has set up, right? And it's right for this uh, digitization acceleration across the board. Next screen. Now, so in Grab, we look at it as a digital transformation for SME. It has to be a trusted and reliable and accurate in the critical payments, especially with enterprise merchants, right? So in the first phase, we built the entire payment system and platform for our own internal use. So we serve internal Grab customers, right? So be it whether is it the ride or the food or, or the Grab mark, right? We are the one that's processing all those payments while we are building up, right? Our optimization in terms of payment performance and operational costs. So whatever we have learned internally, we're going to bring it out. So going out next phase within the next six months, we're going to digitize uh, help merchants to digitize your business in under 30 minutes, right? Because we're going to offer them an e-commerce platform and payment accepting tools. And not only that, we will team up with all the delivery in terms of logistics and payments, right? Phase three is that when we have more uh, business tools and necessary productivity tools for larger enterprise, that is when we will go out, right, to a larger enterprise. That is not saying that everything has to be developed in Grab, but it's through collaboration with the ecosystem. So this is the five minutes uh, take that we have and what Grab is going to do for the digital transformation for SME, right? Not just for COVID, but it's for 
uh, years to come. Yeah. Thank you Thank very you. much, Jeffrey. Well, we'll come back to you during the panel discussion. Next, okay. we can have uh, Merrick Wang. Wang Zhong. Okay. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to be invited to this webinar by SPF on behalf of China Nobel International. Uh, firstly, let, let me share with all of you uh, who is CMCC and, and CMI. China Mobile has the world, world's largest network and customer base with high market share in China. We are also uh, the, the leader for 5G industry. So far, China Mobile has 70 million active users in China. And, and uh, uh, CMI was established by CMCC in, in 2010, which is responsible for the international business and pr providing service to global carriers, enterprise, and the mobile customers. So we have uh, three uh, markets in, in the overseas market. And currently, uh, CMI is operating locally in 22 countries, includes 10 in the Japan region. I think one of our greatest dreams is that we have rich network resources all over the world. Uh, please, next, next page. Yeah. Uh, includes four self-owned data centers, uh, more than 40 uh, submarine and landing cable systems, and over uh, 170 network points globally. This was to mention that uh, Tyson Data Center in Singapore is the first overseas data center owned by CMI. And uh, uh, the pandemic has changed the way we work and live. Next page, please. Uh, but yes, but no matter how it, it changes, the need for economic activity and human uh, interaction will never stop. So uh, from this perspective, uh, this pandemic has sped up digital economy uh, transformation. So uh, from my uh, personal experience, my four-year-old boy has to take online lessons recently. And during this lessons, I, I saw teacher commented on my son's answers with great detail. He, he was very impressed with the teacher. However, I, I was shocked when my, 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 my wife told me that this wonderful teacher was not human, but virtual. But from the way she looks, she, she talks, and she communicates with my kid, I couldn't believe that she is not real, but created by big data and AI type technology. Uh, this virtual teacher can fully take place as a physical teacher. This made me re realize that digital transformation has indeed sprung up around us. Uh, furthermore, in the digital transformation for both individuals and enterprises, the cloud computing is critical. And in, in this market, CMI takes advantage of uh, cloud network resources to provide enterprises with a series of leading digital solutions and works, works with the major cloud uh, providers globally. So CMI has not only played a major role in the battle against the pandemic, but will also continue to support enterprises moving to a digital office in the post-pandemic area. Okay, for, for example, one of our customers, a Singapore enterprise that has offices in China needed to inter interconnect uh, the, the AWS cloud in Singapore with Ali Cloud in China. CMI, uh, as a uh, cloud specialist, we quickly address this uh, requirement. Uh, this customer can easily access to our M Cloud platforms and form better cross border connections. Most importantly, this customer can activate this service with, within minutes through our CMI M Cloud portal. Otherwise, normally, it would have taken at least five days to uh, activity. Uh, okay, well, that, that's about it. I, I, at the end of this part, I'd like to summarize by saying uh, digital transformation has arrived and CMI is ready for its great revolution. 
Okay, thank you for uh, listening. Back thank to you Jenny. very much, Merrick. Yeah, look forward to the conversation afterwards. And um, uh, certainly, just to be sure, even though the you know when you look at us, sometimes because of the virtual background, we look like robots, <laughs> right? So you know, Merrick's child having a virtual teacher robot, uh, it certainly shows that technology has come uh, into the into the homes. Uh, in a big way. Well, the next um, up is uh, Louis. Louis Liu. Louis, over to you. Hello. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for SBF uh, teams to invite me here. It's great to have these sessions to exchange ideas, especially on the digital uh, transformations with audience today. My name is Louis, CEO and uh, founder and CEO of FOMO Pay. FOMO, uh, can you come to my slides? All right. So FOMO, FOMO Pay is a Singapore payment company which is regulated by MAS. We are the first batch of licensing of the major payment institution license holder under MAS. Right? So we provide the digital payment and cross-border money transfer solutions to the merchants in Singapore. Okay, so FOMO was established back in 2015. So we are five years old already. So right now in Singapore, there are close to 10,000 merchants who are using our solution day to day to accept the payment from their individual customer. So basically, uh, as long as you do business, you will need to collect money. So you will come to FOMO for our payment solution, regardless for online payment or offline payment. So right now, you can see uh, entire China Airport, Marina Bay Sand, Resort Wars and Tulsa, they are using some of our different payment solutions. Mm -hmm. So we are a payment gateway. So Let's move on to the next slide. So why payment gateway is important? I believe most of you, you have seen these kinds of uh, stickers in Singapore itself. Uh, this is a uh, local chicken rice shops, uh, whereas they accept okay, more than 10 payment methods in their cashier counter. So the merchant and customers are, are, are always you know, a bit confused because there are too many different kinds of payment methods. And it's always a question for the merchant so who should they sign up? Safe pay, you know, WeChat pay, Grab pay, uh, Visa, Mastercard. So there are too many payment methods. And if the merchant spend the time and effort to connect one by one, it will be too, you know, uh, time consuming. That's why you need the payment gateway. So next slide, please. That's why our value proposition is very clear. We are the payment gateway. We help the merchant to connect to FOMO. You are able to accept all the digital digital payment, you can send cards in the market, no matter the Visa, MasterCard, this kind of credit card payment, to the local payment like uh, Grab is here. So Grab is the dominant payment mode, uh, one of the dominant most popular e-wallets in Singapore. And also including the China e-wallet like WeChat Pay. All right, so and also PayNow, DBS PayLa, UOB Mighty, and uh, OCBC Pen one So concept is, we only front the merchant. So merchant come to FOMO, use our payment solutions. Then they are able to accept all these digital payments, regardless what kind of uh, wallet or credit card their customer want to use. So that's the value that FOMO bring to, uh, to the market in the past five years. And especially during the COVID-19, we have seen a rapid growth and demand for the online payment method. And also uh, for the cross-border payment, especially right now, um, the domestic markets, the consumption uh, need may be limited. So more and more local domestic merchants who will come to us, they look for the Chinese payment, Thai payment, you know, or Malaysian payment, uh, whereas the customer from those countries, they are able to just purchase online and make the payment. Then we will help them to collect money and one lump sum to do the settlement to the local merchant to help them to save all the hassle for money collection for the uh, payment collection, for the reconciliations, and for the settlement requirements. So basically that's what FOMO uh, has been doing. Next slide, please. So uh, our solutions cater to both online payment or offline payment, uh, which means if you are running a physical F&B or retail work, uh, uh, you are able to come to us to find a post payment solution or a mobile app, which you don't have to use any terminals. You are also able to collect all the digital wallet like GrabPay. And you can also use the SGQR solution we provide. Uh, FOMO is also one of the founding members of SGQR Task Force to uh, work together on adoption of the SGQR. So right now, a lot of SMEs who will use a solution from us and then also can get a grant from the government. And if you are running your own online shops, 
regardless you have an IT team to build your own website or you are using those kind of uh, Shopify, you know, WooCommerce to just this kind of um, e-commerce solution to list your website online. So we have all the different kind of online payment methods for you to plug and play. You are able to start to run your uh, business online. So during the COVID, we see more and more, um, I mean, traditionally uh, offline merchants who are turning into online business as they start to digitize their you know, products, their sales, to put it online, and it has been growing significantly. So, yes, a quick summary. So, FOMO is a licensed regulated payment and remittance company in Singapore, and we provide the online and offline payment solution, one-stop payment solution to the local merchants of, you know, the merchants in the region who help you to facilitate on your cross-border money collection or, I mean, uh, international money collection. So that's what we do. And it's very uh, yeah, exciting to be here to share with everyone how we can better help you know, in your business. Back to you, Janet. Yes, thank you very much, Louis. Well, um, for all the audience in the, um, you know, for everyone in the audience, uh, good, I can see that um, the poll results are out. But before we look at the poll results, you know, just a quick summary, you can see that, um, you know, between Merrick, Louis and Jeffrey, they, their aim is to make it easy for SMEs to get onto this digital journey from connectivity, the e-commerce platform, a super app, and of course, payment. So, you know, I mean, we look forward to the discussion a little in a little while. Well, so the host is just sharing the poll results of where companies are. So most of y'all are, uh, twin, you know, manufacturing, professional services. I guess professional services is the largest group. Okay. Uh, next question. Flora, are you okay? I got to close, is it? Okay, we'll come back to the poll questions again a little later. Now you know um, uh, the percentage of um, uh, the audience uh, where you come from. Now, if I can just ask the three speakers, uh, you know, first of all, thank you again for sharing with us. Um, you know, so the first question I have is, um, what are the lessons learned by businesses, you know, yourselves, your customers, your partners, during this COVID-19 crisis? And what examples can you share of how businesses have turned crisis into opportunities. Jeffrey, would you like to start? Okay, sure. Thanks, thanks, Janet. I think the uh, when the virus started out in China, everyone was just looking, right? So China is able to con contain it, so everyone was quite happy. But it didn't realize that the virus has spread around the world in that kind of speed. And therefore, a lot of businesses were caught by surprise that right, government in Singapore also implement a shutdown. Right, they were thinking that well, we just have the safe distancing, we put on the mask if you can, then things will be okay. But things are not going to be the same. So a lot of businesses, uh, nevertheless, was asked to shut for a period of time. And that is where a lot of, uh, you know, like, like a frog, they just jump into the hot water or jump out, right? So they're asking for solutions and so forth. And luckily for us in Grab, uh, we are all ready for them. So in terms of GrabMark, we have set it up a long time ago. So immediately we onboard a lot of the merchants to able to come to, to present their goods for sale, right? especially the grocers themselves, right? the groceries, and also the food. The only thing that we never expect that uh, with the, this shutdown, the airlines industry also shut down. So uh, this is never before. So I guess uh, some of the businesses uh, did have uh, opportunity in terms of uh, health and cleaning, right? hygiene type of companies. But the other type of companies, they are not able to transform, I think, uh, will, will take some time to, to do the transformation. Okay, right. So I guess, yeah, like you said earlier, you know, COVID suddenly accelerated how the merchants have got to come on board. Now, Louis, how about yourselves? Any examples of how businesses have turned crisis to opportunities? In sure. Yes. So... Basically for us, uh, in the past, we do see most of the merchants who come to us for the install payment solutions, like SGQR, like those post terminals to help, uh, I mean, for their payment collections in their restaurant or retail shop or duty-free shop. But starting from uh, COVID-19, we see, I mean, dramatic I mean, uh, inquiries on how to quickly implement the online payment. The reason for online payment is kind of a little bit more expensive in terms of transaction fee, right? Compared to the offline payment. That's why a lot of merchants in the past who 
are a little bit resistant because their offline business is already very good enough, right? They are a little bit resistant to, you know, uh, invest for their online uh, presence. But uh, we do see that in the past uh, half year, so uh, everybody, the, the main change we see, it comes from the mindset. It's really a lot of very established long-term brands who have been operating for more than 60 to 80 years. And we approach them before. Uh, they say, oh, my business is good enough. I don't need the online food ordering. I don't need the online reservation. I don't need to have uh, e-commerce. But right now, the boss, the merchant owner, they have changed their mindset. And then it's much easier to how quickly implement for their online implement. I can give one uh, uh, case study as well. Uh, as we know, not only the business, even the government administration, they are the most, I would say, maybe a little bit more, I mean, they will say, I would say a little bit more conservative to take on the new, you know, digital payment also. So China Embassy, uh, who is one of our clients, so they used to only accept, the, you know, the card payment or I mean, the, as their counter, and you have to go to there and go to the embassy if you are uh, doing any kind of service for those, uh, uh, let's say for the workers. Mm -hmm. uh, you can only queue and then uh, one by one to, you know, right? I mean, to make the physical payment on site. But after the COVID, uh, what they have been doing is they start to explore uh, uh, so-called the cashless embassy service. So everything they put online, they quickly come to us in three days. We put the, you know, for the visa uh, kind of, you know, renewal uh, service or even for the appointment booking, everything is online. And now you have to make payment through the digital payment online before you can get your appointment and you can go there. So that can quickly increase the, uh, enhance the efficiency of the government yeah. and they say oh it's very great right i mean they never tried before they never have online e-commerce before so that's what we we have seen uh what happened in covid the mindset has changed especially for those very you know conservative so parties mm. right so i guess they say um necessity is the mother of all inventions right? mm. <laughs> the invention has been there but necessity you know drives the accelerated implementation thank you Louis, for that so merrick what are some lessons learned in um you know as you see from businesses and, uh, and any examples of how they have turned a crisis to opportunities merrick you are on mute Sorry. Think without, yeah. Mm. Uh, sorry. Uh, thank you, Jenny. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, I think that 5G is very hot right now. Everybody care about 5G. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, China Mobile, China Mobile uh, is the leader for 5G industry. So I think uh, China Mobile country currently has more than uh, 190,000 uh, 5G base stations and uh, 70, million, uh, 70 million active 5G users, which is by far the largest customer volume in the world. Mm. From, from my understanding, with the coming of 5G, the connection between people will gradually shift to people with things, and especially things with things. Uh, compared with 4G, 5G has big advantages, such as high bandwidth, low latency, and big connectivity. And when 5G is combined with IoT, AI, big data technologies, I believe that the digital industry will create a huge room for growth in coming days. And, and right now, uh, China Mobile have many successful cases for uh, 5G application. Here, I would like you to share one case, how we can make use of 5G to transfer logistic uh, industry. Uh, Ning, Ningbo Zhoushan port is one of uh, the, 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 the biggest port in the world, mm -hmm. uh, handling over 1.1 billion ton, tons of cargo in 2019. With such a huge load, no matter of error uh, allowed in any procedure. So uh, China Mobile rolled up a, a total solution utilizing 5G to further improve Zhoushan port safety 
efficiency and management. For, for example, in terms of uh, if efficiency, we have utilized whole latency feature of 5G network. Crane operator could seamlessly control all kinds of cranes in, in succession to reduce the time traveling from crane to crane physically. Making use of less than 10 milliseconds of latency, remote operating in a control center has hugely increased the efficiency of the part. Mm -hmm. And in terms of uh, safety, the high bandwidth feature of 5G allows in instant 4K video transmission of all key working sites. Mm -hmm. Combining edge computing and big data analysis to identify risks from more than 200 key sites. That has addressed the issue that, that cannot be identified manually and provide a better security as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, Jenny, that, that's, that's all from my uh, 5G. Uh, Okay, fantastic. So I hope that you are wor already working with our Singapore port and PSA and others to bring yes. such capability when our 5G infrastructure yes. is ready. Yes. Um, yeah, so, you know, I think th those were all very good examples, you know, from, um, and Jeffrey, I think you wanted to share also a very from, you know, um, at the start, you, you forgot to tell us about the Hawker Centre story, right? Oh, yes. Uh, as you know that in Singapore, the government has always encouraging uh, cashless, right? Actually, the cashless journey in Singapore started in 1985 when NETS was actually formed, right? And I was a former group CEO of NETS. So when I came on board, we wanted to make another last attempt to push for the hawker centers. As usual, hawker centers will give you a thousand and one reasons why they are not ready and why it's so difficult to use and accept digital payments. So until uh, recently, right, last year or so, we managed to convince quite a number of hawkers to go onto this uh, SGQR. But even then, I think Louis will know, it was a very small percentage. It's about only 10%, right? As of today, uh, if I may say, it's like at least 50% or more of the hawkers are already accepting SGQR. They're beginning to enjoy that how simple the SGQR payments is made, especially where, uh, when the payment was made, right? If they had downloaded the app on their phone, right? There will be a, announce, a notification and a voice message that will come out, say $3.50 paid, right? And they really love it because they don't have to do and deal with the change. Mm -hmm. And that is something that is very good. And also from hygiene viewpoint, it's totally contactless, right? Mm -hmm. So there's no contact between the customers and the hawkers. So there's, there's no chance that you can pass the virus over. So I think the hawkers are really enjoying it right now. Right. right. So fantastic. So we have examples from hawkers to China Embassy to, you know, the Chosan Ningbo Chosan port you know, in leveraging, um, you know, uh, technology opportunities to actually, you know, don't waste the crisis. Now, there are a couple of questions before I come back to my own question. Uh, you know, there's a question from the audience, Jessica Kwan, who wants to ask Louis, how can FOMO pay integrate with, ayo, how did that one go so fast until I... <laughs> Oh dear, hang on. How can FOMO pay integrate with B2B SaaS products? to offer convenience of contactless payment methods and help companies to receive payments? Oh, okay. That's a okay, so great question. You can take this one. And then if right. I can tell Mr. Wang, uh, there is also a question for you. Uh, if you can look at the Q&A um, uh, section. Uh, so, Louis, you first. Sure. No problem. Okay, uh, back to this. So, basically, for all the solution. Uh, we call the SI partners, right? Like the post windows, uh, those, those post brand, or those are the IT company who help the merchants to develop their own e-commerce website, like, like Shopify solution or WooCommerce solution. We pro formal will provide one universal API, which already integrate with different kind of payment method. That's why we only give you one API document. Those SaaS uh, solution providers, you just need to integrate the payment uh, function into your own products or solutions, then you are able to provide to your customers. And we will do the revenue share with you uh, as a SaaS solution provider. So that's our model. So one API we pass to your IT team, you are able to do your integration. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So all the SaaS product providers, <laughs> you can contact for more later. All right, so Wang Zhong, the question for you is, um, uh, you know, um, has the COVID-19 changed the way traditional telcos compete with the likes of unified communications players like Zoom or Cisco? 
Will traditional telco business models still be relevant and what do they need to do to survive in a post-COVID world? Okay. Uh... Uh, I think that's, that's uh, the, the, the tough question for all of our uh, companies in yes. telecom and uh, digital industry. So actually, uh, CMI, we, uh, since the beginning of uh, the COVID-19, uh, we uh, uh, already have uh, some uh, mature solutions for, for, for the, the digital solutions and have enterprise to uh, to work on work on cloud and uh, and uh, uh, can connect with all of the platforms with our uh, products uh, such as uh, uh, we have the uh, M Cloud platform as I mentioned before this platform uh, provides a chance for CMI to help uh, enterprise like uh, the Singapore enterprise customers who want to invest or uh, develop in China market. Uh, CMI is one of the three licensed cross-border connectivity providers in China. So we can uh, provide fundamental network support and uh, remote, uh, remote office platform for enterprises to overcome the difficulties caused by the pandemic or, or any other global issues. So as I said before, the, this, this M-Cloud portal can provide multi-cloud and cross-border service for Singapore enterprise, uh, especially at MES, the small and middle enterprises, to control the cost and reduce operating expenses. So I think uh, CMA will try to provide the low cost, the fast and the flexible network access, cloud services and SET services, for for all kinds of uh, Singapore enterprise to spread up uh, of uh, Southeast Asia or APEC A region and uh, build connection uh, world worldwide. Mm -hmm. uh, another uh, case is that, for example, Singapore has world uh, world leading healthcare system and medical enterprises. There is the advantage of uh, Singapore in pandemic. I think. So by using uh, IoT, AI, and big data, CMA can enable Singapore med medical in institutions and companies to provide remote medical care services to the hosp hospitals and patients across the border. border. This technology, I think, can drive the development of the medical industry in Singapore and also can benefit more people uh, around the world. So Thank you. That's my Thank view. Thank you. Yeah, but like Merrick said, you know, I mean, traditional telcos that cannot survive just by being the traditional telco, and that's why they are going into all the different areas. And uh, you know, one classic case is leveraging five G. All right, I'm sure they are not the telcos are not going to just offer the five G network, but you know, uh, partnerships and collaborations of applications. Yes, um, you know, on the 5G. Minus, minus, minus. Now there is a question uh, which any of y'all may want to answer or help to answer and that is uh, one of our audience asks what is digital economy? So I'm going to attempt first by reading a definition okay from um, from Science Daily. All right so for the for the whoever asked that question the digital economy refers to an economy that is based on digital technologies. So the digital economy is sometimes called the internet economy the new economy or the web economy. But increasingly, the digital economy is intertwined with the traditional economy. All right. So all of us know that once upon a time, you know, I mean, there were actually maybe 10 years ago, you know, there were, there were digital banks just on its own digital banks. All right. And then, I mean, the classic is, is, is classic case is that now hybrid is the, is the way to go. You know, no traditional bank can be just a traditional bank without the digital, all right? And so, you know, with that, with this setting, I was going to ask Louis, you know, what does he, you know, and I know both Grab as well as uh, AMTD and others, you know, are all involved in this digital bank um, space. So maybe you all want to comment 
you know, on the digital economy and perhaps a little bit about uh, how, how do you perceive, um, you know, the intertwine between digital business and the traditional business? Sure. Uh, thanks, Janet. I think, uh, I mean, it's a very broad concept, but if I just put into the real, uh, I mean, some uh, detailed context, I will give a few keywords. The first one is the real mindset among the people. Does that mean that if I put my business online, it means a digital economy? The answer is no. Does that mean that if uh, the government say, oh, I'm building a, you know, a, a cashless society, but I mean, like many other uh, countries in the world who are also doing this, I mean, but there's no real much, uh, you know, new regulations to come and protect. Does that mean a really di digital economy? The answer is no. So what I would say is first, from the mindset uh, perspective is everybody looks at this kind of digital, uh, this kind of world or kind of stuff. I mean, you deeply uh, take it from the, uh, I mean, from the bottom of your heart. What we are looking at right now is about the digital bank, for example, which is coming to uh, issue a, a five uh, new digital bank license. One of the requirements by the Central Bank of Singapore is you are not allowed to have any single physical branch. Everything must be digital. So uh, and, uh, right now, for uh, Grab is uh, one of the uh, key players applying for the digital full banking license. And FOMO is part of our uh, AMTD group. We are also applying for the digital wholesale banking uh, license right now. But when we are doing the product design of this digital bank, compared to the current bank apps we can see in the market, uh, so the, when we start from the scratch to do design, to design this banking product, we realize you have to use totally different kind of, you know, the mindset to look at this. So user experience uh, and, uh, you know, it's not important. And we need to, I mean, uh, if you look at the, if I use WeChat Pay or Grab Pay as examples, they never log you out, for example, right? So they never log you out. Whenever you want to make a payment, you just open the apps and then you just either scan the QR or you, you trans do the transfer and authorize the transaction. But you don't have to log in the apps every single time, like most of the bank's apps who are doing. So this is one way, right? Digital kind of mindset when you design the product. And another one is from the regulation perspective. So Singapore right now is taking the leading advantage. I mean, they're taking the leading position worldwide. Uh, in terms of the digital economy, it's more, imp uh, more importantly, from the regulator perspective, they are giving a lot of new regulations to encourage and promote, you know, the innovations um, about the FinTech, especially the Payment Service Act, which come into place earlier this year in January. So uh, there's one scope. Uh, talking about the digital payment token, for example. So which means Singapore Central Banks is now looking at the serious players and decent players and giving them a license for them to run those kind of you know digital payment token. But in mo most of layman terms, they're talking about the cryptocurrencies, right? That's why a lot of crypto exchange who are coming to Singapore and applying for their license. So, so but, but it's always a controversial kind of mindset about you know crypto. This is a token, right? Uh, we hear a lot of story about Bitcoin. A lot of people are talking about investment or even, you know, uh, uh, I mean, some crimes even about the Bitcoin, but whether is this is good or bad, you can hardly to give a definition. But why this is important for the digital economy? You must, you know, give them a way to innovate and to try out under the, you know, uh, very strict regulations, which is why we see the Singapore government is, uh, is having this kind of risk-based approach for the regulations to to encourage such kind of fintech solution or uh, fintech innovation in Singapore. That's why from regulation perspective, it's very important to uh, really build a digital economy. So those are the two main concepts I would like to, to bring up and to, to discuss here, to share with the audience, uh, how we look at the digital economy. Yeah. Yes, fantastic. So it's a, it's a case of, you know, regulation must keep up and in fact, encourage innovation and a risk-based approach like you mentioned. And uh, of course, at the same time, must uh, safeguard uh, the security and protection for the retail consumers. Exactly. In, uh, yes. And of course, of companies. All right. right. So I, I know time is a little bit running short already. So I'm just going to ask, uh, you know, Jeffrey, this question. You know, I mean, do you expect the world and the markets to be restored to what it was pre-COVID? And I presume the answer is no. Lah. So, and if not, no, what will structurally change 
and therefore, you know, what would be your advice to companies, you know, um, uh, you know, to to you know uh, actually get themselves, uh, you know, started in this journey? I think uh, twenty years ago, uh, I still remember where. Uh, internet was just starting out, right? Especially in Asia, but US already happened in 1990s. And then they talk about brick and mortar, then click and mortar, and then somehow, you know, the click and mortar fades away, the brick and mortar still stands. But what have uh, COVID shown us is that, right, there's a possibility that in the future, there may be another shutdown, we don't know, right? So now the companies are now more aware that there's a possibility now. And hence, I, I guess, like what you say correctly, right, is now becoming like a hybrid model. Not only they need the brick and mortar, they also need the click and mortar or the digital economy that we are talking about. So now I think most of our company will definitely will deploy their digital strategy already. So mm -hmm. I think this uh, COVID has actually brought a new, new, new normal, right, which is, I think, created more opportunities for, for everyone, right, especially Singapore being such a small, uh, in terms of land mass, but with digital economy, with the companies, we can go worldwide. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. And if I can ask Merrick Wang Zhong, what role can Singapore play to support companies, you know, your customers, partners, and yourselves, and as well as your industry's growth and aspirations? Okay. Uh, yeah, everybody knows that the Singapore is the, the economic center of the uh, uh, impact region, as well as the network hub, you know. So uh, I think uh, Singapore has attracted a lot of uh, vast global investments. So from CMA uh, perspective, in order to support all of this global enterprise, we have uh, invested four seven cable uh, here and the various local network resources. And the one data center I mentioned, the testing data center in Singapore. Uh, besides that, there are many, uh, I think there are many IoT, AI, and ICT partners in Singapore. So we, we hope to cooperate, cooperate with them and bring their solutions and the technologies to the customers in China. For example, uh, <clears throat> I think uh, Singapore, as I mentioned, Singapore has uh, the, some advanced uh, the, the, the health, health, care, health care system. So, uh, I, I, I also suggest that this, this uh, medical technology can share with all of uh, uh, the people who, who require this, this, this uh, service in the world. So uh, I think CMA can help uh, uh, medical industry of Singapore to benefit uh, more and more people in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, Louis, you want to add on to anything else for this question? Anything else, uh, Louis? Oh, okay. Uh, I, I think uh, Wang Zhong Merrick has uh, has made a very good point. I, I have I don't have much to add on. Yeah. Okay. okay. I guess then the question for you, um, you know, Louis, would be back to the thing about structural change. How do you think you know traditional guys like Visa, Mastercard will respond? Mm. Okay. Sure. So Visa, Mastercard are international payment companies. Um, they have been, uh, they are the, the, the industry leaders. They set up the rules for the credit card. That's why you can still see the NFC payment and the card payment like tap and go are still the, 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 the I mean, most popular cashless payment solutions in Singapore and in many uh, other developed economy, right? So I would say uh, it's not a kind of competition. It's more like, a, complementary with each other. So Visa MasterCard as a uh, international card schemes, they are looking at international, I mean global markets, but whereas there are still a lot of rooms for the local domestic market, whereas you know the, the people here, let's say we are here in Singapore, we, mm -hmm. we can have some more local customized solutions, uh, whereas the transaction fee can be you know uh, much more cost effective, right? Uh, if you are a Singapore merchant and your customer is a Singapore citizen, I mean, as a Singapore, uh, as a people in Singapore, there's, you can use those kind of domestic payment like Nets or GrabPay, which can enjoy a much lower transaction fee for the merchant side compared to, you know, a tourist who use their, you know, uh, I mean, maybe uh, US uh, Visa card to spend in Singapore. That's why for a merchant, especially for Singapore as an international hub, it's better for you to 
be more, you know, international. So uh, on the one side, you accept all the uh, credit card, like Visa, MasterCard. Uh, and on the other side, please be open to look at those kind of local domestic payment, which is like what the government is promoting, like SG2R, like GrabPay, like Centel Dash, uh, uh, like the Pay Now, because this one can help you significantly reduce your uh, transaction fee. That's uh, what we, we say. So it's more like a complementary to each other. Mm -hmm. uh, and we can learn a lot from those international companies as a pure Singapore payment company. Yep. Okay, excellent. Well, I'm just showing the um, poll results. I think all of you all can see it. You know, I mean, come, there looks like, uh, you know, quite a lot of companies have started on their digitalization journey. And, um, you know, I think you all, I'm sure this is going to be made available to everyone uh, as to what are the activities that they are working on and the benefits that they are looking, you know, increased productivity and efficiency seems to be one big one and engaging customers uh, will be the investment that they want to work on. <laughs> so, you know, and um, so I think it's very positive to see that the group of people who are attending today's session, uh, you know, obviously you all may already be the converted and also you all uh, definitely looking to deeper, uh, you know, to to deepen to deepen your implementations and to broaden your um, your expect to broaden the uh, you know the enhancements of those systems. Uh, this last question: What kind of support do you wish to receive to enhance the pace of digital adoption? All right, government investments and funding schemes. Well, you know, intentionally we have no government speakers on this on this panel, so we'll take that question. But to be very frank. All right, the digital resilience budget has put a lot of money into this whole space. So if you all are still not very familiar, please do contact SPF and understand more. All right, because the digital resilience budget is actually very, um, is a very rich uh, budget, a uh, rich package to actually help our companies to get on board with digitalization. All right, and of course, uh, there are many other schemes uh, you know, in relation to uh, transformation, the whole business transformation, not just digital. So I'll encourage all companies, please contact SBF or look for their chatbot uh, to find out more. Um, and uh, I think one of the areas that we did not have a chance to talk about is, is of course, the free trade agreements. All right, Singapore has actually got many free trade agreements, but in particular, since we are talking digital, you know, there are, we have already signed two, Singapore government has signed two digital economy agreements, DEA, uh, you know, with uh, Chile and with New Zealand. And I believe during COVID, they have also penned down uh, with Australia. All right, um, and um, so, you know, look out for this space. In fact, we should definitely leverage based on all the opportunities that our panel panel speakers have shared with us. Everything from e-commerce to impending 5G applications, whether in logistics, in healthcare, and I'm sure a lot more, automotive, etc. You know, and then the whole space on, um, you know, digital payments, in, you know, integrated digital payments, actually, both online and offline. And uh, all the opportunities in relation to either building digital business on its own or getting ready to leverage a hybrid uh, you know, hybrid kind of a business model with both online and offline. Well, you know, time is um, always short when it comes to a very interesting and uh, lots of expert, expert um, sharing. So if I can just very quickly ask, um, you know, uh, the panelists uh, to think about one word or one phrase you would like to leave the audience with as an encouragement or a call to action, right? Um, and... Um, yeah, so while y'all are thinking, while y'all are thinking of that one word or one phrase, you know, I'd like to give you a quote from our founding Prime Minister of Singapore, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, who talks about change. All right, change is the very essence of life. The moment we cease to change, to be able to adapt, to adjust, to respond effectively to new situations, a la COVID, then we have begun to die. So I hope, you know, uh, you know we'll take heed from uh, our you know, Mr. Lee's, um, you know, wise words. So if I may ask, uh, Jeffrey, why don't we start? What's the yeah. one, one phrase? Yeah, for one phrase, I'll say, get on the bandwagon to embrace the change of digital economy, right? Thank you. Louis? Louis, you're on mute. Okay, sure. So 
digital banking is coming. Please pay attention to that and be open to that and ju just take a try, okay? Starting from the digital payment, but digital banking is coming. It's not in a few years time, it's in the next few months or at the most one year time. Okay, thank you, Louis. Wang Zhong. Okay, uh, I want to say that despite tough, tough times ahead of us, uh, keeping the economy open and collaborating as the most effective ways to overcome all of them. Uh, and we, we look forward to working hand in hand with Singapore local enterprise in the uh, transformation of digital, digital economy. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Wang Zhong. So for me, my word is REAP, R-E-A-P, R-E-A-P. Resilience, energizing, agile and adaptable, and purposeful. All right, I think this is one time in history uh, whereby, frankly, you know, the whole, whole world is in a reset, all right? So companies and businesses, we have an opportunity to actually rethink rethink who we are and who we want to be and what is our purpose of being both as individuals and as companies and in the whole society so you know i think it is wonderful that we have an opportunity today uh, to listen to our three panelists you know share with us some hopeful opportunities and hopefully we can chart some rainbows you know even if it is a, if it is in a stormy day and, um, you know, uh, one of the things I personally lived in China, in Beijing for eight and a half years. So I must quote you, uh, you know, a saying uh, by uh, Deng Xiaoping. You know, in English, it says, crossing the river by touching the stones. You know, mo de shi tou guo he. All right, I know we are all in that kind of a mode because we don't really know exactly what is, what is going to be the next step, what is going to be the next thing that happens. But I think most important is let's keep, you know, that um, uh, resilient, positive attitude uh, you know, to everything that we are doing, whether it's in learning, whether it's in adapting, and whether it's in charting our companies for the new future. All right. So with that, I, you know, I hand you back to Flora. You know, again, I thank, you know, I ask you all to, you know, uh, thank all my panel speakers for their wonderful uh, sharing. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Th Thank you, Merrick. Thank you, uh, Jeffrey and Ruiz, for the very insightful sharing and discussion in the past one hour. And a special thank you to Jeanette for the wonderful moderation and uh, just now to make our discussion so interesting and uh, informative. We really appreciate the time and effort uh, all, the, all of uh, four of you have spent for this webinar, including all those preparation work. Um, I would also like to thank all the attendees for joining us today and coming up with such a wonderful list of questions. As mentioned just now at the beginning of the webinar, uh, for those questions that are unanswered, we will work with the speakers and get back to you uh, individually later. We would also like to invite you to join us at the SBF China and North Asia Business Group uh, as a member, which is a complimentary service provided by SBF. Once you join this business group, you'll be able to receive future event invitations and updates on China and North Asia markets from us. And lastly, appreciate it if you can spend one to two minutes filling up the feedback poll as a uh, pop-up right now on your screen. Uh, this will help us improve our event management, content development, etc. for the upcoming webinars. Once again, thank you everyone. Uh, please stay safe and healthy. See you in our future events very soon. Goodbye. Thank you, Flora. Thank you, thank you. We Thanks for the, the support. Panelists to just stay so that we can take a, take a picture together. Okay. Oh, yes. Flora, you want to do it? Yes, we, we, will do, we can do the screenshot. Okay. Okay. One, two, three. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thanks you for the support. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, thank you. Thanks so much. Right. It's our honor. Right. Ladies Bye -bye. and gentlemen, Welcome on board the journey to internationalization. For companies who are keen to venture overseas, Global Connect at SPF is here to partner you along this exciting journey. Be it about identifying the right market for expansion, or strengthening your capabilities, or taking your first step into the market, Global Connect at SPF can help in the following areas. 
internationalization advisory, market information, business matching, capability development, and in-market facilitation.